Hi everybody, Darina here, and this is ACI Course 1, The Principal Teachings of Buddhism. This is Class 3, What is a Qualified Teacher? At, this, at the end of this class, you should be able to list and recognize the ten qualities of a good Dharma teacher. That's it. One objective. Today we are talking about the qualities of a good teacher. Pabonka began his teaching of Jason Kappa's 14th verses inspired by the first line in the root text which states, I bow to all the high and holy lamas. Lama is the Tibetan term for spiritual teacher and is similar to the Sanskrit term guru. Since we don't have an English equivalent for spiritual teacher, Lama and Guru are being adopted by our language and are often used without translations, like, like you see here. This one line, placed at the beginning of the text, emphasizes the importance of having a personal spiritual teacher. Certainly, if we are trying to get someplace that is difficult to find, we are more certain to arrive there if we have someone who knows the way personally take us there. Freedom from mental afflictions and total enlightenment are high goals and not easy things to be reached. But we can reach them faster with a personal guide who knows the way. So how do we know who we can trust our precious life and spiritual growth to? That's what this class is about. The ten qualities of a good Dharma teacher. As part of your second reading, Pabanka refers to the jewel of the sutras. Actually, the third reading, Pabanka refers to the Jewel of the Sutras, also known as the Ornament of the Sutras, a book by Master Asanga. Now, Master Asanga lived about 350 A.D., and he received this teaching directly from Maitreya, the future Buddha. And in the teaching, he, he says, Take yourself to a spiritual guide, controlled, at peace, high peace, with exceeding qualities and effort, who's rich in scripture, with a deep realization of suchness, a master instructor who is the very image of love and beyond becoming discouraged. Pabanka urges us to become familiar with these qualities of a proper teacher and then go out and find a teacher that possesses them. The ten quality lists here are controlled, at peace, high peace, exceeding qualities, effort, rich in scripture, Deep Realization of Suchness, Master Instructor, Image of Love, and Beyond Becoming Discouraged. We're going to go over each of those ten qualities in detail so that we can understand exactly what he means by each of these words since they're almost like a code. The first one, Dolwa in Tibetan, is Tamed Morality. This means that the teacher practices the extraordinary training in ethics, which boils down to they have the ability to control themselves. So they're not, you know, if, if nothing else, they're not lying, they're not stealing, they're not doing sexual misconduct. So they, they are, they've tamed themselves. Only in this way can they tame you. So this is one of the more important parts of Buddhism is to be able to have clear ethics and live an ethical life because that's what then will bring you merit and lead to further realizations. Shiva or at peace. So this one is practicing the extra extraordinary training in concentration. In particular this means that the teacher has the ability to be mindful of what they're doing in order to keep their morality. So they kind of go hand in hand. So they've, they've gotten to a level of concentration and mindfulness where they're able to be aware of what they're doing and be able to make course adjustments if they need to. That's Shiva. Near Shiva, very peaceful. So we go one more level up. And this is means the practices that the Extraordinary training in wisdom. In this case, the person has achieved full calm abiding, or shamatha, and is able to use that ability to investigate reality. So wisdom, in this context, is about being able to 
see emptiness, being able to investigate what ultimate reality is. And to be able to do that, one has to reach, this, reach the platform, the meditative platform of shamatha or calm abiding. And so the teacher has that ability. Yuntan Halkpa. So the teacher should exceed the spiritual qualities of the, the student, which makes just perfect sense. I mean, if you're going to get a teacher, they should know a little bit more than you, at least a little bit more. And the more the better, but certainly a little bit more will get you to the next step. The teacher should also have a joyful effort. Sometimes we could just call this effort, but um, I like to put the word joyful in there because effort in our language means, you know, striving and kind of, kind of means getting all hot and sweaty and really working hard. And in this context, effort is really a code word for taking joy and doing good. So it's not really effort in the way we look at it. It's almost effortless. It's like, hey, you love doing it. And in the case of a teacher, it would be that the teacher takes joy in helping the students. They like doing it and will just put effort forth to do it. But not in the sense of having to strive, but in the sense of like it's almost effortless. Our next quality is the teacher should be rich in scripture. Having a deep knowledge of the sacred text. So not only should they have the mental qualities of morality, of concentration, and of wisdom from direct experience, they need to have a rich knowledge of sacred texts, especially if they're looking at guiding people even a little bit further than where, where they are. So, you know, they have the light on shining ahead of everyone. It's like, okay, you know, the text that coming directly from the Buddha. Deep realization of suchness. This, this means, suchness is, is another word for emptiness or ultimate reality. And in this case, it, the person should have perceived emptiness directly. So that's the ideal thing. Again, you, if you're wanting to follow a master, you're wanting to follow someone, you want someone who's already done or has had as much realization as farther, much farther along on the path than you are. So having perceived emptiness directly is, is a boon. Um, at least, if they haven't perceived emptiness directly, at least they should have a good understanding of emptiness from scriptural study and from intellectual analysis. So they've spent a lot of time investigating it on other levels, if not directly. So ideally this means um, that they have perceived emptiness directly, though. Master teacher. So this is a, a key word again. What is a master teacher? Well, in this case, a master teacher refers to a teacher that knows the capacity and the level of the students and is able to match the amount and order of teachings to the student. So you've got someone who's actually can see the student, can quickly judge what the student, where the student is, and then adapt the lecture or the teaching to match the student that's there. Image of love. So our a quality of the teacher is that the teacher is an image of love, which basically means that the, teach, the teacher is teaching out of love and not some other type of motivation like fame or fortune or, or anything else that might be of, of, the, of the world. And then our final quality will be that the teacher should be tireless. And I like to use that one word, tireless. It's sometimes just being, it's called beyond becoming discouraged, which basically means that the, the teacher is able to answer over and over again the same question. Or, you know, so they're, they're tireless in the sense that, hey, you know, they'll, they'll demonstrate and talk about the same subjects over and over again, you know, for the benefit of the students. So those are the ten characteristics of a qualified teacher. They obtain morality. They're peaceful. They're very peaceful. Their abilities exceed those of the students. They take joy in doing good. 
They're rich in scripture. They have a deep realization of suchness. A master teacher knowing the level and capacity of the student. They're the image of love. And they're tireless. So how do you find a teacher like that? Well, start off, you need to start where you are. The thing that I've noticed is teachers might not always look the way you expected them to. So you might want to look around yourself to see if there are people in your life that are your teachers right now. They might not call themselves teacher, but they might be working with you at the level you are, and they might be on a different look at in a different form. I know that my first spiritual teacher um, I didn't recognize till many years later and till actually still I started studying Buddhism is like, oh, that's what she was. You know, because it wasn't and I was, I was getting daily personal instruction from this person and never was it never was she called a teacher or never did she promote herself as a teacher. But she was definitely guiding me. So look around where you are now and you might already have someone who's who's guiding you. The other way is if you're trying to find a teacher, one of the ways to create the karma for that is to res be respectful of all teachers. One of the consequences of not being respectful to teachers in the past is that you might have difficulty in this lifetime getting finding your teacher, finding someone to teach you. So what you want to do is serve teachers and then dedicate the goodness to yours, you know, your teacher. So you can do two things, serve te teachers in general, which will create the karma to get a, t a teacher, but also dedicating it to the person who's going to be teaching you will set that in motion. So you become expectant of finding your teacher. Another way, karmically speaking, is if you want to see someone teaching you, what do you do? You teach others. So starting at your level and your ability, and it doesn't even have to necessarily be dharma, but dharma would be great, teach others. Um, you know, when people ask you to do, you know, ask you to teach them, then do it and offer to guide and help people in any way. It can be small ways. I mean, if you have any kind of skill, um, offering to show other people how to do it is a perfect way to create the karma to find a teacher. And then, you know, just keep studying, keep practicing the path and praying. Um, your teacher will find you. Um, Geshe Michael talks about how he found his tantric teacher by using a very simple prayer that, his, that he was told to use, and that was, My Lama Loves Me. Nothing more than that. And that's the kind of prayer that's going to attract. I mean, it's an affirmation, My Lama Loves Me. He didn't know where his teacher was, but that kind of affirmation led him to find his teacher. And, and we, we, there's different types of teachers, too, because we're talking about, when we talk about this, we're talking about a teacher that becomes a personal guide for you. Certainly, there's going to be people who are teaching you Dharma, teaching you information, and um, they are very valuable. But there's also a certain point in the practice where you need individual instruction and you need um, individual um, guidance. And... Typically, people move into relationships that are very close with their teachers on, on some level. And so this is the type of what we call sometimes a heart teacher. And certainly a tantric teacher is a very special relationship because part of the, the tantric path involves a lot of um, special work with your teacher. Your teacher becomes a, a very important guide in this case. So, so with a heart teacher, you're looking for someone that you can devote yourself to and and in that sense devote yourself to your spiritual practice and of course study practice and pray when the student is ready the teacher will appear they say so definitely we know that the Buddhas can emanate and they can come in any form so you might be getting guidance all along and when you're needing you're ready and you're it's necessary for you to have a physical form human teacher that will happen I have no doubt. So, so don't worry too much about it. Just keep doing the practice, and it will just fall into place. So once you find a teacher, the Pabunkad Rinpoche talks about how to take a lama, how to take a teacher. And he stresses that the proper behavior towards one's teacher has tremendous potential. 
both good and bad. And you'll see in the reading that there's a couple scary little stories about people losing their eyes and stuff like that. Um, and read the footnotes that go with that because the stories are in the footnotes that explain those. So, so he's talking about how bad behavior can lead to negative things happening, which I, I, I take with a grain of salt. I'm not completely, um, I believe it and I don't believe it at the same time. So, and I, but the idea that how you behave towards your, how your teacher has p potential in a good way, I can really see because the truth is, if you really respect the teachings, and we're looking at your teachers holding information that can bring you to enlightenment, to get you out of the suffering, then if you really like want that, and this is the person who's got that, then you're naturally going to value them as, value them as such. And so, on one hand, if you want to get to enlightenment, but you don't value the information that you're getting, then you don't really, it's, you can see it doesn't make sense. If you value it, then you're going to value your teacher. If you don't value the information, then your teacher's not important either. They're not valuable. And it goes hand in foot. The more value you put on the information, the more closer you get to enlightenment. It's kind of a cause and effect kind of thing. So, the other thing to remember is your teacher is empty. So whatever you're seeing, if you're seeing a teacher that doesn't have very good qualities or you're not, you keep running into people who disappoint you, then you need to remember that it is you, the teacher's a blank slate, and it's your karma that's projecting onto them. Again, so how you're acting towards your teacher is what's going to create your teacher in the future. So... If you're not satisfied with your teacher, then you look back to yourself to see what you could do, be doing more. If your teacher is lacking morality, if you're seeing lack of morality in your teacher, you know, if you're seeing um, they're lying or they're stealing or they're made, motivated by wrong motives or sexual misconduct, then then it that is coming from your karmic seeds. You're you're seeing that. Not ev other people see the teacher and they might see them not as having those problems. They might not see them as lacking, um, having issues with their morality. So, anyway, so your teacher is empty. And the other thing to remember is that either your teacher is an enlightened being already, or, remember the Buddhas have this ability to, to know and to help you, or that thought that just came out their mouth might have been put there by an enlightened being. So, so there's a certain level of like, again, it's got to do with value. The more you value what you're hearing, the more valuable it will become. And so it's that crosswords going, it's that um, chain of effects, basically. So remember, and it, the more you teach, treat your teacher like a diamond holder, and diamond, be, diamond being that that vehicle that's going to get you to enlightenment, the more they become that. And I think Pabunk at the, at the end talks about a little bit about practices that people do in order to um, create better teacher karma, basically. So, homework number three. There's only one question. It's going to be those ten qualities of a teacher, a good teacher. So you'll, the quiz is going to be pretty easy because you know what's going to be in it because there's only one question. <laughs> so that's that. And then your memorization, move on. So you've memorized the first two prayers, the refuge prayer, prayer and the, the dedication prayer. And now memorize the offering, the mandala prayer in Tibetan. And I know it can be a lot. It was a lot for me to memorize all those prayers. And I actually kind of got them confused. So you might want to start at it or just make sure you've got the first two down really good. So and, and think about, you know, splitting up a little bit. But take a look at that and spend some time with the offering the mandala prayer in Tibetan. The meditation continues to be on renunciation. So I think we have another week of renunciation. So again, start keep thinking about what renunciation is. Uh, you might want a new twist with this because we've been talking about teachers. Think about how you would act towards a teacher if you had true renunciation. Think about what you might do if you ran into a teacher and you had true renunciation. I like to think about the story of um, Jesus when he ran into his apostles. What did they do? 
they were all fishermen, right? Or most of them were fishermen. And he walked by and said, follow me. And they recognized him as their teacher. They dropped their nets and they left. That was it. They were done. It's a good story because it talks about, you know, in that, I mean, I don't know if they had true renunciation before that, but when they saw him, they had renunciation and they left their worldly things and followed him. So that's a good thing to think about renunciation as it pertains to a relationship with a teacher. In our next class, oh, and remember to write down your dates and times of the meditation to get credit for them, credit for the homework. The next class, we're going to talk about the qualities of a good student. So we just went over the qualities of a good teacher. Now we'll look at what a good student looks like. And then, more importantly, it seems to me, what constitutes authentic dharma? So how do we know, so we've got a good teacher, how do we know with what we're getting, what they're teaching us, is really authentic dharma? It's the, really going to be the stuff that gets us to enlightenment. So this, this class will talk about how we can identify and make sure we've got essential, authentic dharma. So we just did an incredibly good deed. Um, let's dedicate the goodness to the benefit of all sentient beings. May they complete the collections of merit and wisdom. Bless you. Bye.